Welcome back to another edition of the Beyond the Snap podcast. Uh, I'm here today with Kirtan, and uh, I got one thing for y'all before we get started. You know, we like to get right into it, but 84.7% of y'all are still not subscribed. I don't know why. Does not cost you anything. It's completely free. 84.7% of our listeners are not subscribed, and that's crazy to me. So yeah, uh, but we're going to get right into it with a little talk about how the NCAA uh, and Tennessee have kind of entered the ring and are, you know, really just slapping each other. Um, and yeah, so if you have not paid attention much recently to the kind of news uh, in this offseason period, the NCAA has basically, they kind of did it subtly. They did it on the down low. They leaked to the press that they're investigating Tennessee for what is basically NIL violations. That's the long and the short of it. And Tennessee, their athletic director uh, and the chancellor of the university, both uh, wrote basically very strongly worded letters uh, back to the NCAA. And here is what their athletic director, um, he is, his name is Danny White, uh, and he's the, obviously the athletic director here at Tennessee. And this was part of his statement that he made uh, a couple of days ago. Oh. This is obviously silly and not productive, as is blaming the membership whenever they are challenged. We need to be spending our time and energy on solutions to better organize college athletics in the NIL era, something that the NCAA leadership failed to do back in 2021. Student athletes, prospective student athletes, coaches, and administrators across the country deserve better, and I refuse to allow the NCAA to irrationally use Tennessee as an example for their own agenda. Uh, end quote. So... This statement comes in response to the NCAA who issued a statement. Basically, it's kind of a bidding war of statements that ended in a lawsuit. Um, so the what you need to know is that Tennessee is basically trying to take the teeth out of the NCAA. They're kind of saying they're an outdated, uh, improperly functioning organization that is not doing well. They're not doing what they need to do, and they're not regulating college football. And... To me, this is really kind of a key moment, right? This could be the first domino in really changing the organization of college football to conference-based regulation. Uh, this, along with a lot of other uh, violations that the NCAA has punished Florida State and others. Uh, but, Kirsten, let's go ahead and get your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, well, first off, like I always say, um, this is another example of NCAA trying to make a fool out of Tennessee. They're trying to say, hey, look, you, like every other team in the nation, are using NIL to your benefit, but because of the fact that y'all are using a little too much, you're persuading players that really you shouldn't be persuading because of the fact you're throwing so much dough at them, and we're going to make now make you the fools. We're going to make y'all the example to prove to everyone in the league that just because we release the beast of NIL to everyone, just because you have more money, we still need to find ways to regulate it. And like, I, and what I meant to say was just because you have more money doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want with it. There needs to be some regulations. And I side with Tennessee on this case because it's almost like the NCAA opened Pandora's box and let NIL be for everyone. You can use players' name and likeness, get money from them, blah, blah, blah. You can get all these things. But now you're like in a situation where players are just going to wherever all the money is. And I know we've covered this before, but like there needs to be something else. There needs to be like culture. Is NIL really going to take over? And is NIL just being like going to be abused essentially and saying, look, what's the richest program off the top of my head? Texas. Can Texas just throw a bag at every single number one recruit in the nation to get them to commit? And they'll just go not because of the fact that they think it's better culture, because of the better coaching, better players, better chance to win. They'll go to USF if USF says, here's – $3.1 million, please sign with us and please come over here. I bet you that's what's going to end up happening. And so Tennessee is in the right to sue. Um, I think Tennessee is now going to either they're going, they are taking the teeth, like you said, out of NCAA, but they're going to make NCAA change its rules for everyone and not punish Tennessee, but rather implement rules from now on for the 2025 season that player like teams cannot use and. IL to recruit majorly on a mass scale and there needs to be some sort of like cap limit to it. Those are my thoughts, Kieran. What are your yours? Yeah. So I think that that's kind of where we're headed. 
Um, and ultimately, I think it's this is kind of the beginning of the change, and I'm not going to speculate. And this is going to continue to be breaking news, and we'll cover it with maybe a short or something like that uh, if it does come out, and it'll be on the YouTube channel. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's a – it's a very kind of razor's edge subject that could spill over in any minute. And it's going to be a continually changing subject. So to say that, Oh yes, this is exactly what's going to happen right now. I think is a little premature, but the, the impact of it should not be understated. The fact that there's going to be a lawsuit and there's going to be a legal decision on NIL uh, for what is, I think, you know, it's certainly a groundbreaking at least case if not one of the first lawsuits in this area. So to me, that's really important. And I think that's going to state the impact. So now we're going to move after your little bit, your little dose of current events. Um, We've got, and throw up the banner, throw up the banner. It is a new segment alert. This one is hot off the presses. This one is brand new for this podcast for episode eight, brand new. It's a new segment, and we're going to call it Gridiron Graduates. All right, so in this segment, we're going to talk about some of our favorite players, and we've just picked a handful for today. We're going to talk about some of our favorite players that we watched in college or that, you know, a lot of people watched in college and how they have, you know, morphed and progressed in the NFL and how they're doing uh, at the next level. Uh, and Kirtan, do you want to go ahead and open with your first gridiron graduate? All righty. So the first one I listed was your rookie of the year this year in the NFL, the Ohio State Buckeyes captain. He got them to the fourth seed and almost made the playoffs by beating Georgia last year, or almost made it to the finals beating Georgia last year. And, of course, I'm talking about Houston Texans number seven, C.J. Stroud. Um, I listed him as a gridiron um, graduate because of the fact that it was such a close race for who was going to be the first one taken off the board between him and Bryce Young. As we all know, Bryce Young edged him out and took and took the uh, first spot at Carolina, which I don't know how people feel about that. I don't know if that was a good or bad thing for C- for Bryce Young. Uh, based off of right now, it was a bad thing because the team still went like two and like ten to an eleven. But C.J. Stroud, on the other hand, someone who everyone real I didn't predict him to be the best player in all of like football or the best rookie in all of football, beat uh, B. John Robinson, a one in a million running back, beat all these different uh, players to get the rookie of the year, and it's well deserved. I mean, he took a Houston Texans team who got a brand new head coach, brand new edge rusher who's also on the board. I believe Kieran will list him soon. And they had a brand new quarterback in C.J. Stroud, and he took that team to the, um, not even the wild card, to the divisional round, as he ended up beating uh, the Browns in the wild card round on the first round of the playoffs. So that just speaks to this new Texans team. It speaks to C.J. Stroud's character because I don't know if Kieran knew this, but apparently there were some tests that C.J. Stroud did before he got drafted. And it turned out that he was, like, really dumb or something. Like, he had no football knowledge or, like, his football IQ was, like, suboptimal. And that was one of the, that was another reason why they were pa- or he got passed up by the Panthers. But apparently it's not only football IQ that matters anymore because he is just a straight baller, to be honest. He came into the league. He looked solid from week in, week out. He got injured for a little bit, but he came back. And he's just been such a dominant force. And it's, like, everything's turning up for him in that city. And honestly, you can expect Houston to be a dominant force from now on as Will Anderson seems to be progressing well, the coach is there to stay, and C.J. Stratt has been doing phenomenal. Kieran, give me someone else. Yeah, so talking about, speaking of Will Anderson, just going to go ahead and give you the nice segue here. Will Anderson, I think, has had a really great season. I think this whole Texans defense has had a really great season, but to me it kind of stood out in that wild card round where they were just, they looked dominant, right? And even in the early stages of that divisional round, the the amount of harassment that occurred, especially from that Texans D-line on both Joe Flacco and Lamar Jackson in the early stages of that game was just, I mean, it was dynamic. And I think that speaks to Domico Ryan's talents as a coach, but I think it also speaks to a really, really great draft pick in Will Anderson. 
He was a linebacker out of Bama. He's transitioned to more of a hybrid kind of edge rusher, almost TJ Watt like role. Uh, very good off the edge, dynamic. He's got a great, um, just great, a good sense for the ball. He's able to find the ball, and he kind of plays defensive end like a linebacker, which he used to be, right? Uh, and still is in a little bit in some ways. But he's able to beat that tackle around the outside. But he's also, you know, you don't see him getting beat by a screen a whole lot or other kinds of trick plays like that that tend to trip up D-lines. He's very smart. He's cerebral. And I think he's going to become a leader on that defense. You know, the Texans throughout their stint in the NFL have been known for largely not great offenses, but really great or at least star-studded defenses um, with having obviously some of the best defensive players in J.J. Watt and Brian Cushing and just these really big, huge defensive, you know, leader archetypes. And I think he may be the next one uh, down there in Houston, not to mention uh, the other great players on that team. But Kirtan, hit me up uh, with another degree recipient, another graduate, if you will. Um, I'm going to kick this one to probably someone that Kieran might like, might hate. We're going to go with Baker Mayfield, the quarterback for Oklahoma, who won a Heisman um, and was just an outstanding quarterback in what seemed high school level, college level. And now he is doing well after a rocky start with his career in the Browns, then to L.A. and now finally at Tampa where he's made a home. Uh, I'm talking about Baker Mayfield. Mayfield, uh, when I first started watching him, was really early on. Uh, I remember when he was one of the highest ranked players in all of the league, and he came just down, like just down by Lake Travis, was the high school that he actually attended. So I remember my dad um, telling me about him and how he had it between Texas and Oklahoma, and he chose the rival, the red-blooded Oklahoma. And he is just such a notorious player. He honestly, he doesn't remind me of a player. He reminds me of an MMA fighter. And I'm talking about Conor McGregor with all of his antics with his little dance that he does. Um, but Baker Mayfield throughout his NFL level has was really uh, rocky because when he was with the Browns, they were doing horrible. Uh, he was making a lot of money based off the ads that he was getting. But besides that, his gameplay wasn't that good. And then he ended up getting shipped off after Sean Watson left. I don't know. I don't know if he went to another team, but I know he definitely went to LA, and he won one game with LA and then sold it for them. And then he now is at Tampa, and this is post Brady. And so now with Brady gone, he kind of made a home for himself. He solidified his win in the NFC South, I believe it is. And of course, the NFC South consists of the Panthers, Buccaneers. And I forgot two other horrible teams, the Falcons and the Panthers, if I didn't say, or the Saints. And these are all horrible teams, to be honest. These are all one of the bottom feeder teams. And so even though this is not a good team, Baker Mayfield still surprised everyone, and he beat the Philadelphia Eagles and Devonta Smith and Jalen Hurts, who were arguably one of the best teams in the entire league. And so you have to give him his flowers. I hope he gets a contract renewal. He made it to the Pro Bowl games. And so that's another one of my favorite gridiron graduates. All right. So my perhaps favorite player that's in the pros, and the only reason I watch any NFL games at all during the regular season, I am not an NFL guy. I very much think college football is more emotional uh, and just much a much better game. It's a more pure form of the game. It's, you know, there's not as many penalties, terrible refs, and Taylor Swift's. Um, very good factors, reasons why do you watch college football, right? Um, but the only reason I watched the regular season was one man, and in him we trust, B. John Robinson. Um, and, I mean, I can't say enough about B. John Robinson. I know people think his rookie season wasn't that great, but the other day, you know, the NFL YouTube channel put out a list of all of his touchdowns. And the amount of his touchdowns that are no way plays, right, that are crazy, oh my gosh, I can't believe he caught that, you know, the one-handed screen pass touchdown where Desmond Ritter literally just lobbed it, Bijan was looking upfield, I don't think he expected to catch it, he catches it with one hand on his butt and then takes it in for the touchdown, you know, making guys miss 
um, just crazy tackles, just flying all over the place, sliding all over the turf. I think he's one of the most dynamic players in football. He is obviously, and I think he's thoroughly proved this, even at the highest level, that he's a generational talent. Um, he's crazy good. Uh, I think he was underused by Atlanta. I think they went to, you know, Patterson and other running backs too much. And I think they, you know, he was great in the pass game. But even then, I think they targeted him too little. They didn't cater to their really, you know, their outstanding, what I think is Atlanta's best player. Um, but, you know, I will always be a little bit of an Atlanta Falcons fan just because of B. John Robinson and watching him do all the things he did in college for Texas. You know, in many ways, he was that team uh, for several years. He was dynamic. He was the best running back in college football. And now I truly believe uh, he will be, in very short order, the best running back in the NFL. Um, it was really fun to watch in college, and he's doing great in the NFL. And if you get a chance, please go watch him. I mean, watch his highlights. It's just insane. Um, and yeah, Kirtan, uh, give me another doctorate, a doctorate of football, if you will. Uh, this time we'll go with a wide receiver. Um, this guy was a Heisman winner. I believe he was one of the only, or since Adrian Peterson or since Derrick Henry, one of the two was the first non QB, um, Heisman in such a long period of time. This is Devonta Smith. He was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles in the first round. And most notably went to the Super Bowl last year. Uh, for those who do pay attention to a lot of NFL stuff, you probably know who Devonta Smith is. He is arguably the first, arguably the second best player, or second best wide receiver, or first best wide receiver in Philadelphia behind A.J. Brown. He is very elusive. He is just, su he was such a great player in uh, college when he played for Alabama. Um, most notably, you probably all know his catch that he made against Georgia in the NCAA championship where after they subbed off Jalen Hurts and they brought in Tua on one of the like last plays or overtime, they threw like this bomb to Devonta Smith who burned everyone and scored a touchdown. Um, he is just so versatile at so many different levels. We know exactly what he can do. We know he can run the short routes. He is just a route runner, and he runs everything to perfection. He can get open in space. He is a little shorter and a little skinnier than most of the guys that you probably want to see. But nonetheless, he was just such a dominant force in college, and I'm happy to see him do well in the pros. And he's been to the playoffs both times, and he's with his quarterback, Jalen Hurts, again, reunited. Um, but besides that, the only one that else that I can really mention that really brings me joy in saying is Mac Jones. Uh, for y'all that don't remember, who do, Alabama had one of the most dominant QB rooms in all of college football at one point. They had Jalen Hurts, starting quarterback of Philadelphia Eagles. They had Tua Tagovailoa, starting quarterback of the Dolphins. And they had Mac Jones. Probably will never see the field again unless he's a backup. Um, they were all in the same QB room in Alabama. And he also was an outstanding quarterback. I don't think he won a Heisman. I think he got close to it. But he was also a really good quarterback. And he was supposed to be Tom Brady's predecessor after uh, – or ancestor, actually, after um, he retired and left. And he was coached underneath Bill Belichick. We were hoping he was going to be the next best thing. Turns out he was not. Turns out his team is bad. Turns out at one game they only scored three points because he's so bad. He got benched for Bailey Zappi. Um, a whole bunch of stuff. And so he probably will never see the field again. I hope he doesn't. I don't think he's that good of a quarterback. And it's honestly going to make me happy to see uh, the Patriots tumble and fall for a little bit. But uh, besides that, he was really he was a fun player to watch in college because you saw – Jalen Hurts, an improviser. You saw two who can run on the wheels, and then you just saw this generic white quarterback take over for Alabama, and that it was just so fun to watch. And so that those are my two. That season was crazy dominant, though. Just that to point was. Out, he was great in college. Some of them are busts in the pros. Two of them might end up being a bust. Too many checkdowns, buddy. Too many checkdowns. Um, but moving on to the player that got robbed for the MVP, um. Really just, I mean, an all-around great player. Everybody, you know, arguably the best all-around offensive player in the NFL. Someone who I, as a, you know, and probably very few of you know this, unless you were close to me when I was a very young child, I had dreams of going to Stanford uh, and going to college there. Maybe I will. Maybe I still do. You'll see. You'll have to keep tuning in for the next couple of years. Um, but... 
I always love to watch Stanford football, even no matter how bad they got trounced in the Pac-12 because they were all smart kids. Um, but Christian McCaffrey, watching Christian McCaffrey at Stanford was a special experiment, uh, experience and just something I'll never forget, right? He's kind of that stereotypical, the nerd guy that does well and just knows football so well and has got crazy quickness and crazy agility and is just able to go, you know, go, 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 go. And I think that was evidenced in the uh, championship game that he's played in recently. And I think you're going to see it in the Super Bowl where he could be a deciding factor. He's gotten tons of attention. You know, remember he had crazy games at Stanford, especially in the bowl games. There was one game where he scored on the first play from scrimmage and then scored on the next drive and then scored on the drive after that and just went on hot streaks, you know, 50-yard runs, busting it up the sidelines. That's Christian McCaffrey, and that's why he is probably uh, the Ph.D., the gridiron Ph.D., uh, at least mine, for this segment today. Um, but, Kirtan, you got anyone else? Yeah, uh, and lastly, I'll say oh, – I'll take two, and I'll give you the best one for last. Um, I'm going to talk about the most dominant team in all of college football for the past – decade, de- two decades, and this, of course, was the 2019 LSU Tigers, rounded with Joe Burrow, Edward Tolaire, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Randy Moss's son, Thaddeus Moss. Uh, this offense was outstanding. The defense, I don't really know as well. I'm only familiar with the offense because the offense was the one putting up points, and that was crushing it. And I'll talk about the two wide receivers. Um, the two wide receivers that came out of LSU 2019 – were Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. Y'all are probably familiar with both of these players as Justin Jefferson is arguably the number one wide receiver in all of NFL, maybe behind Tyreek Hill. And Jamar Chase, if he had Joe Burrow for the season or last season, he was deemed a top five player in all of the league. Uh, And that just shows you how talented this team was. So if you can imagine these two on the same team in college, think about what they did in the, uh, or in the same team in, the NFL level, they were on the same team. Okay, I'm getting confused here. On the NFL level, they are the best players in the league. But on the college level, they were on the same team. And they were just dominant. Uh, most notably, you know them from Joe Burrow basically being able to scramble and throw the ball against uh, Texas, for instance. And throw a touchdown on Texas late in the game for the win to, I believe, it was Justin Jefferson. You know Jamar Chase for being lightning fast. You know Justin Jefferson for being... One of probably the best hands in the last like decade, um, and for this reason, these are my also P. These are the P. These are the gridiron masters, and they got their master's degree from LSU, and they've just been cooking all these years. And I think sooner or later, maybe last year, you could say uh, just Jefferson and Burrow were both PhDs, but right now they're all in the master's level. And then you can kick it off, Karen, with the last guy. Yeah, so I got Joe Burrow. Um, he has been, I think he was a good quarterback, right? Made it to the AFC championship that year and then lost to the chiefs, uh, because the NFL, you know, maybe it's scripted. Maybe the chiefs are just that good. I, um, so yeah, so he, um, he's been a good consistent quarterback. He didn't play as well this year and then signed a huge contract and proceeded to immediately get injured. Uh, which is really tough for him. And I know he wanted to play and wanted to do well. Uh, But Cincinnati didn't do great this year. But you have to think they'll be back next year. And Burrow will be using that uh, master's degree uh, to cash in on some touchdowns. Um, So, yeah, uh, that's going to wrap up this segment. And, yeah, we're going to do – we'll probably give you a little more of this segment next week. Uh, along with maybe a little Super Bowl sneak peek, uh, a little advice for particularly from me to the defense of the San Francisco 49ers. Please play man on Travis Kelsey, please. That's my one request. I'm a very humble man, but please play man. No one else has done it. You just put someone on and he's done. That's my little thought. That's my little rant. Uh, And now we're going to move to another new-ish segment, full of new segments today, uh, that we're going to call Conference Coverage. Uh, So we did it last week uh, with the Intrepid ACC. 
Uh, and this week we're going to do it with a big 10. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and kick us off by talking about uh, your 2024, 2025 big 10 champion. Uh, the got to get the hat here. Ohio state Buckeyes. See the hat, Ohio state. There you go. Um, I think they're going to be dominant. Um, I think they're going to get that W. I think they're going to take care of the top conference title. I think with the Michigan hump out of the way, or at least somewhat diminished, and with the NIL coffers being almost completely drained, assuredly, they can't have more money, right? <laughs> Maybe they do. Um, so, you know, they're going to go to – I don't think they have a hugely hard schedule, uh, especially considering the talent they've got, the talent they've got returning – uh, the upgraded quarterback, the crazy wide receivers, the insane defense starred, uh, headlined by Caleb Downs and Tommy Eichenberg, uh, the great D-line as always. Uh, and to me, there's really just no one to contest with them. Uh, I don't think that while other people have been competing with them, I think that there's going to be some adjustments, some issues from those other uh, segments. And I just think that in general, it's not going to be – as big um, as everyone makes it out to be. I think that their closest competition, and this is my prediction for the title game, uh, is Oregon. So I think that Oregon is, you know, they're a great team. They put together a great roster. They got Evan Stewart. Uh, they've got Dylan Gabriel. They've got crazy players from all over. But I just think they're not as fundamentally sound on the lines of scrimmage, returning talent there, uh, as Ohio State is. And I think they're not quite as physical as Ohio State because they were more physical than Washington, although they arguably got bullied by Washington's O-line almost twice, right? Uh, get letting Penix get comfortable and pick apart that defense. And I just think that they're, you know, they've got to transition uh, into the Big Ten. They've got transition everywhere. Uh, they've been in a little bit of turmoil. And I just think that Oregon's not quite ready for that championship run yet. And I think Ohio State's going to get it done. Uh, and Ryan Day is going to dismiss and uh, let all the naysayers know um, and dismiss the doubts at Ohio State. But, Kirtan, what's your championship and championship game prediction? Um, for these two, I have your championship being – or your championship game being Ohio State, like you mentioned, a dominant team headlined by Caleb Downs, headlined by all the returning players and the new quarterback, Will Howard. Um, this team seems like a force to be reckoned with. I just covered them in my latest episode of the film study with Gareth and Amin. Uh, I talked about how I don't know how this game is going to play. I don't know if this game is going to be close. I don't know if this game is going to be a, like really close. I don't know if it's going to be an upset. But I did say for this title game and for the regular season game, I have Oregon winning. Um, that's also because Oregon will be at home for their home or for the regular season game. And I think Oregon will get the ball rolling. Dan Lanning will not slow down. And for that reason, like I said, I'm going to put Oregon as my champion. I think Oregon has been too close. They've tasted victory too many times not to get there. And they really want to make an impact in this brand-new Big Ten. They really want to show up and say, look, we're not we're the Pac-12, but we, we came to play. We put one we put one team into the playoffs, and we were, all, we were this close to putting two teams in there. While the Big Ten, all you had was Michigan and Ohio State, maybe, like, far down the road. And so – for this reason, I do think Oregon will be your champions. I do think Dan Lanning will stand on business. I think Ohio State, they're going to get there. I think Ryan Day will be able to beat Michigan and Sharon Moore. But I don't think they're there yet. We'll see because, again, this is a 12-team playoff. This, doesn't make, this isn't a make-or-break game. This is a make the top four or make the top ten, essentially. And so I have this game going to Oregon and Oregon being your champions. All right, yeah. So now I'm going to give you a little little rundown of my surprise and disappointment team. Um, so my surprise team is a team that I think is, you know, their trajectory has really changed, right? They've gone from what is a considerable downward slope and a downward slide um, to, I think, an upward trajectory. Uh, I think they're going to be surprisingly good this year and surprisingly well put together to move from, you know, right, you've got tiers in any conference, and I think they're going to move from that bottom tier to, you know, one of the middle tiers, and I think that team's going to be Michigan State, 
uh, with Aiden Childs coming uh, over at QB and Jonathan Smith uh, leading the squad at head coach there. I just think that Michigan State, they've made a really good, solid hire in Jonathan Smith from Oregon State. And I think that he's moving into the Big Ten, but I don't think he's going to be, you know, at a loss or really confused because Oregon State was a physical team. And I think he'll build another physical team. And I think that Michigan State is going to be your surprise team. I wouldn't be surprised if they're a 7-5, and 8-4 and four team, maybe even a little better, just depending on how the ball rolls. Um, we'll predict schedules in depth uh, and records in depth later, but I think they're a surprise team. I think they're a team to watch. And if you want to go bet on them, I'm sure the line is probably great right now and not many people uh, are thinking about this um, in, you know, early February here. I just think that, you know, if you want to go bet on Michigan State, uh, want to take the over early, I have no clue what that line is, but that might be a good idea. Um, and then for your disappointment team, uh, they are known by many names, um, the University of Spoiled Children, the University of Second Choice, but we don't discuss that here. We're just going to say that USC is, I think, going to be a disappointment team. I think that, you know, USC hopes or their their idea is that they're going to be the second best team coming in uh, behind Oregon. And I don't think that's the case. I think Lincoln Riley is doing his best to fix that squad, but I just don't think there's any way to right that ship this um, this quickly. And with this, you know, this lack of really big commitments or huge increases in resources. So I think that USC is going to kind of continue, continue the, the sink. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the Trojan War is coming to an end uh, and the Greeks are getting to them a little bit. Didn't think you'd see an Iliad reference. There you go. Uh, I know everything, of course. Um, and I think that USC, they're going to be a disappointment. And I think they're going to be a bottom feeder Big Ten team next year. But who's your surprise and disappointment teams, Garrett? Okay, so for my surprise team, I have the team that poached the number one quarterback in the nation in this recruiting class. I have a team that was captained by a guy that's been up and down as their head coach. Uh, he's been up, he's been in the NFL, he fell down. And, of course, I'm talking about Matt Rule, and I'm talking about his Ohio State team. Um, or not Ohio State, and his Nebraska Cornhuskers team. The reason board, I say baby. this, yes, sir. Uh, the reason I say this is because Nebraska seemed to be stable. They didn't seem that they were tanking. They didn't seem like they were a team spiraling down. They seemed like a team that was always neutral, always like six wins. Um, mediocre is the best word to put for them. Average, they were never the best team in the Big Ten. They were never the worst. But now that they're moving the ball, they're getting Dylan Rayola, who is probably the best, if like the best quarterback in the upcoming draft or in the upcoming recruiting class. My bad. They're bringing in because of him. They're getting a train reaction, and they're bringing in other players that want to play with him. It's almost like the Arch Manning effect that happened in Texas, where once he committed, all these other five star wide receivers, all these other four star running backs, they all decided that hey, Texas looks pretty good now. And it's going to be like that. And so for that reason, I have this pressing being Nebraska. I think Nebraska has a great year. I think if they do have a great year and they actually do well and they become number three, number two in the Big Ten, which I know is a big ass compared to what the Big Ten is having this year. But if they are able to get up there, they're going to bring in more talent. And who knows, they could become the Nebraska of old and become that dominant team again. Um, and for your disappointment team, like Karen said, a team that is a surprise team is one that was on a gradual downhill slope that is going to make a big improvement, or known as a parabola. In this case, I'm going this way with it. I'm going to say a team that was going up and all the way up, all the way till they got to the climax of the mountain, and are now are coming down, also known as minus or negative x squared graft. A team that's going up, 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 and made it to the top. And I'm talking about Michigan Wolverines. Michigan under John Harbaugh, or Jim Harbaugh, I mean, was doing outstanding. He was climbing, 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 made it to the quarterfinals, uh, lost to TCU. He was always in the conversation and always beat Ohio State, no matter if it was at Ann Arbor or if it was in Columbus. He was always beating them. And that is an impressive feat, knowing that Ohio State was one of the top-tier teams of this decade as well. 
And so now that team reached the top of the mountain. Blake Corm's getting drafted. Jake, uh, JJ McCarthy's getting drafted. Jim Harbaugh's leaving. And so now the ship has gone from smooth sailing up to who's our quarterback of the future? Who's our running back of the future? Who is Sharon Moore going to live up to the hype or is he not? Is they going to fall or is Ryan Day going to get his win? And so that's the slope that's going to happen. And so your disappointment team will be Michigan because we're going to still expect them to make playoffs. But honestly, I feel like this could be a TCU scenario where you made it to the top and now it's just bad vibes. Everything's going downhill and it's not going to be a fun thing to watch. All right, there you go. So this is now not only an ancient literature podcast, but it's a math podcast. There you go. Stick that in the description. Uh, You got algebra, boys. Um, Boys and girls out there. So now we move on to the worst team. And for me, the worst team is hard to predict. Because is it the worst team in relation to their expectations? Is it the worst team in the amount of fall-off? Or is it just the team that lost to every other team? There's kind of some debate there, right? Uh, But to me, I think the worst team next year is going to be UCLA. Uh, Chip Kelly, if you haven't heard, is flirting heavily with the NFL uh, and taking, I believe, a defensive coordinator position uh, at various teams. I think it's not just one team at this point. There's more than one team in the running. and. I think UCLA is going to fall off. I think they kind of, you know, have gotten on Chip Kelly's bad side. I think he's ready to move on. And I think he sees that maybe the NFL is the place to go right now. So I think that's where he's going to head. And I think UCLA is just going to have the roster fall off. They lost their quarterback. They're losing um, kind of what they had left in the draft. And I, they didn't really bring in anybody notable in recruiting. And I think that's going to be your worst team in the Big Ten. Uh, but who, who do you have for his worst team, uh, Kirtan? Yeah, and so the worst team I have for the Big Ten is going to be the Indiana Hoosiers or Hoosiers. I don't really know how to say the name, Hoosiers. But the reason I say this team is going to be the worst is because they were the seventh best team in the Big Ten last year. They went 3-9, and nine, and everything is just falling apart. Penn State is expected to hire their uh, their coach or their assistant coach as their defensive coordinator. The team is falling apart, and it's almost like that place you go to essentially go to a different place. And I don't know. I know that doesn't make that much sense, but it's almost like you go to community college, so one day you can feed into University of Texas, so one day you can feed into A and M. It's almost like that. You're going to Indiana, so you can build a name, and then you transfer, kind of like Arizona State. Jane McDaniel's Arizona State, LSU. <laughs> And so not to disrespect any of the Indiana fans, but all I'm saying is I don't think y'all are really going to trend up. Uh, It's been kind of a stalemate. I think UCLA has your number because of the fact that no matter what, UCLA is just the better team in the end of the day. I think y'all are just going to deprogress, and sooner or later y'all are going to fall because y'all schedule, and I was just looking at it, it looks bad. I mean, the only games I see y'all winning are maybe FIU, but even though I'm scared of FIU's beating you, I think UCLA is going to beat you. I have a lot of things I would be worried if I was you. And then there's just teams that, like, you have no business losing to, but somehow you're going to lose to, um, what's their name, Charlotte, 49ers. And then it's just all going to be downhill. And so for that reason, you're, dis- your point- you're not your disappointment team. Your worst team of all of Big Ten will be the Indiana Hoosiers. All right. So now we're going to move on to – Oh, what did we say? Best player? Yeah. Player of the year and coach of the year. So my player of the year is a certain person um, who I've talked about a lot on this podcast. Perhaps, no, not more than warranted. For sure, not more than warranted. Uh, Because, ladies and gentlemen, he is, uh, I think, a Heisman contender. I think he's the best defensive player that we've seen in a while. He's dynamic, he's physical, he's fast, he's a good tackler, he's great in coverage. Um, and that is, I mean, there's no other There's no other way to do this. There's no other person I could possibly put here, Caleb Downs. I think he's going to be the player of the year. I think that he had, you know, the freshman year of betting in, starting for Alabama. I know, a little wild. He's that good. He is that good, folks. Um, and... I think that this year he's going to have a breakout year. He's going to lead that defense uh, along with Tommy Eichenberg again. And they're going to have a great pair of that one-two punch at safety and linebacker 
uh, and he's just going to go crazy. I don't think there's going to be many uh, quarterbacks and offenses that can contend with the, just the coverage and the skills of Caleb Downs. So I think for that reason, he's going to stand out and be player of the year. It is not a quarterback. It is what I think will be my favorite defensive player and the defensive player you've got to watch next year. It is Caleb Downs. Uh, and my coach of the year is a coach I've already talked about. Uh, I think my coach of the year has to be Jonathan Smith. I Again, I think he's going to take Michigan State from a bottom feeder to a middle-of-the-pack team this year and improve on that next year because I think Michigan State really got themselves a great hire. He knows how to build a program, and he knows how to build a conference, a top-of-the-conference program, and I think that's what he's going to do there, and that's why he's going to be my 2024 coach of the year. Uh, but, Kirtan, who do you got? Yeah, and so for my player of the year, I have no other but the QB of Oregon Ducks and your Big Ten future winners, according to my prediction, Dylan Gabriel. I think he'll be the winner because I think he is finally going to get some hardware in his trophy. I think he's a proven quarterback, and when he plays good, he is a very, very good quarterback. He's one of the best in the nation. We saw what he did against Texas in the Red River Showdown. And we know what he's capable of. We know like when everything clicks for him, he's going to be a dominant force. And paired with everyone on that Oregon team, he's going to be unstoppable. And so I trust him to do what's right and to win the entire thing. Um, and so I think he will be the player of the year. I feel like it's bold putting Caleb Downs there. I think it will probably be rightfully deserved, especially if Ohio State wins. But it's really hard for a defense player to get any awards in today's day and age and which is such a sad thing to say but ever since Charles Woodson I mean he's really defined it but no one else has really stepped up to the plate to play defense like has been a defensive superstar and so for that matter I'm gonna have I'm gonna have uh who do you call it? I'm gonna have Dylan Gabriel win and then for coach of the year I have him being the coach of my surprise team of the year I have him being the coach of the number one recruit in the nation uh this is gonna be Matt Rule I think Matt Rule has had an up-and-down career, and I think now being at Nebraska, he's going to stabilize, he's going to build, and he's just going to progressively get better. It's going to be like one of those things that you – it, it happens very slowly. It's a gradual scale. And so now the pieces are going to start lining up for the Cornhuskers, and then it's going to start stacking, 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 and then it'll end up being Nebraska sneaking up on teams like USC that, we, that I at least predict to still be somewhat decent. And so I'm going to put Matt Rule sneaking in and winning the Coach of the Year. All right. I think those are great predictions. Uh, and that's going to wrap up our uh, conference our conference coverage. Um, so that's going to actually kind of conclude this episode, a little bit of a shorter episode for y'all. Um, thank you for listening through the whole thing. We really appreciate uh, y'all's viewer and listenership. Uh, it's been great. We're growing the channel. Um, next season is going to be a great season. This year is going to be a great year. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, uh, listening. Please subscribe, uh, send us any questions, comments, or outrageously hot takes, please. Um, at, uh, beyond the snap, uh, at, uh, beyond the snap football rather, uh, at gmail.com. Uh, please email us there. Uh, please subscribe. Uh, have a great day. And Kirtan, what are your final thoughts? Um, my final thoughts are thank you for everyone listening. We are really trying to produce better content for everyone on every single level. And we just want you all to interact more. Please, like you said, email us. Put qu questions in the comments. I promise you we'll get to them as fast as possible. Um, I just want to say if you are a college football player and off the off chance that you are listening to this, I know that's probably very, very rare, but if you are, like Jane Daniels, please come up on the podcast. Please show up. Please um, email us, and we would love to have people guest speak that are big in the college football world. We want people that know what they're talking about and know the inside knowledge that we don't. And so that's it for me, Kieran. Yep. Uh, thank you, and have a great day. See you on the next episode.